Hello and welcome to Youthful Idiots. I'm Aaron Mate. And I'm Katie Helper. And as always, if you want to go to usefulidiots.substack.com, you head there and you get all kinds of bonus content and you get to support us. Yes, you get not only do you get full extended interviews, but you also get this great thing called Thursday Throwdowns, which is where we react to media. Uh, and it's a great time. And we talk about things that often the rest of the media ignores or misses. Plus, this week we have a very special uh, Thursday Throwdown feature where we talk to Aaron Mate about testifying in front of the UN. That's right, Aaron Mate. I think the UN must have known it was getting to the end of your birthday month. They're like, we got to give this guy a present. And the best present for Aaron Mate is letting him testify about uh, chemical weapons covered up in Syria. (laughs) So it is one of the best birthday presents. So we're going to be talking about that and not only Aaron's uh, testimony at the UN, but some haters. And we're going to respond to them. Yes, we will. Uh, And before we get to that, let's get to our four basic food groups. What do we have for Democrats Suck? So for Democrats Suck, uh, let's turn to The Guardian, where we have a very interesting article. Biden administration quietly resumes deportations to Russia. Exclusive apparent reversal of position adopted after invasion of Ukraine sends men fleeing Putin's draft back to Russia. So they've quietly, without much fanfare, obviously, uh, resumed deporting people to Russia and they had stopped uh, after Russia invaded Ukraine. So they suspended these removals at that time. And people are a little bit surprised because at the same time as the Biden administration is, of course, talking about how uh, dangerous Russia is, how dangerous Putin is, and how he's mobilizing citizens to fight in Ukraine, they are forcing said citizens who are not in Russia back to Russia. Uh, and people have already been deported. Um, and they don't want to go back to Russia because they don't want to face prison for opposition or they don't want to be sent to the front line. There you have it. I think it's a little bit hypocritical of this administration to be doing that personally. Yeah, and this comes also as Biden is uh, mulling again, imprisoning immigrant families, uh, something that he condemned uh, when Trump was doing it. And ramping up in for, uh, law enforcement on the border and bragging about that. But now deporting Russians back to Russia, that makes me think we need a new Mueller investigation to see. Because if, mm. if Trump did that, he'd be accused of conspiring with Putin. So maybe right. we need a new Mueller investigation to, to get to the bottom of this. It's Mueller time again. Yeah, Mueller time. Yeah. All right. So for Republicans suck, there's been another school me- shooting in the U.S., a deadly school shooting in Tennessee. So that means it's another time for Republicans to announce that they have no solutions on offer, will do nothing, and that all they can offer is thoughts and prayers. So first up, here is Congress member Tim Burchett of Tennessee being very blunt about what Congress will do in response to yet another school shooting. Three precious little kids lost their lives, and I believe three adults, I believe this. And... Um, and the shooter, of course, lost their life too. So it's, it's a horrible, horrible situation. And we're not going to fix it. Criminals are going to be criminals. And my daddy fought in the Second World War, fought in the Pacific, fought the Japanese. And he told me, he said, buddy, he said, if somebody wants to take you out and doesn't mind losing their life, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it. Wow. What his father might not have known is that his son was going to become a lawmaker one day and thus in a position to not allow someone who might want to take him out or take out children in a school the opportunity to buy assault weapons. Right. And maybe if his father had known that, he might have said, son, if you're in Congress one day and you can pass a law that bans people from buying assault weapons which they can use to take you out, you should vote in favor of that rather than saying we're not going to fix it. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's Im- I mean, it's almost impressively honest. His yeah. lack of uh, concern, how nonchalant he is and how accepting he is, that it just has to be this way. Well, here's one more a member of Congress uh, in the Senate, Mike Rounds, a Republican from South Dakota. Rounds. Also, wow. Mike Rounds, yeah, appropriately named, also saying that Republicans will not do anything. I, look, I, I put myself in a position where I look at those, those families and, and I see these things and I look at my colleagues up here and there isn't anybody here 
that if they could find the right approach, wouldn't try to do something because they feel that pain. And yet, when we start talking about bans or challenging on the Second Amendment, I think the things that have already been done have gone about as far as we're going to with gun control. I do think there are some things that can be done. And let me just give you one example. It's one that we already started working on. We've already introduced legislation. We've got uh, about $500 million that we think over a five-year period of time that's already been allocated for putting in solar panels at schools. Could we reallocate that back over a five-year period of time, provide grants back to the states, and allow them to go back in and help individual school districts to actually protect those, those schools, make them uh, more difficult to get into? I like that he found the real enemy, solar panels. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's the answer here. Go after solar panels. Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's like, so, we're not talking about we're we're not talking about bans because for some reason it'd be more effective. Rather than banning assault weapons, it'd be good to take money out of solar panels. That's his logic. Right. They should just do a buyback. It won't solve everything, but it'll get a bunch out of the people's hands. I mean, they it should do anything. The hands, the, yeah, they should, they should, they do should ban these. Yeah. They should ban assault rifles. Right. Well, um, that's good. Yeah. You know, every place that's been done, that's reduced gun violence. I mean, right. it's, it's obvious why. Uh, but of course, they're not because this is their thing. They right. love guns. This is their, yeah. And they love all guns, even assault rifles. Right. But uh, here is one member of Congress who does have something to offer, and that is House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, who has on offer thoughts and prayers. Yeah, the first thing in any kind of tragedy I do is as I pray, I pray for the victims, pray for their families. Uh, I, I, I really get angry when I see people trying to politicize it for their own personal agenda, especially when we don't even know the facts. There are facts coming out. It looks like the shooter originally went to another school that uh, had real stronger, much stronger security and ultimately went to this school. Let's get the facts uh, and let's let's work to see if there's something that we can do to help secure school. I wonder if he thinks that uh, getting rid of solar panels is politicizing a shooting. <laughs> yeah. He himself, of course, was shot. He was shot. That's yeah. right. That's right. He was. Well, let's pray for a reallocation of funding from solar panels into more armed guards at schools, I guess. Yeah. I guess that's one thing that he wants us to pray for. Right. All right. Well, let's go to uh, Isn't That Weird? So for Isn't That Weird, let us go to the land of Japan. Just reading a story at Daily Star. Penis Festival distances itself from offensive mascot with throbbing veins. The annual spring festival has been held every year since 1969 That's funny. to celebrate male fertility. But for the last eight years, the event has had an unofficial mascot, an imposter penis with warts and all. So um, the organizers behind the event say they want to distance themselves from the unofficial mascot who has hijacked the festival. The Shinto Kanemara Matsuri Festival of the Steel Phallus is an annual festival held each spring at the Kanayama Shrine in Kawasaki, Japan, with thousands descending to celebrate the traditional symbol of fertility. But uh, bosses claim this uh, this penis mascot is uh, tarnishing the tradition. And here's a, pe a picture of the penis mascot. I think he's kind of cute. He doesn't really look like a penis. I don't know what he looks like. I guess he does look like a penis. But a human penis, like a penis that is a human being. That's a fine mascot. They should be proud of that mascot. <laughs> they should be proud of that mascot. Yeah. They yeah. should stop uh, kink shaming that mascot. But let me just tell you what usually happens at this celebration. Okay, three large phallic shrines are carried through the streets, and um, it's based on a legend of a demon who sought revenge on a woman for rejecting him. Out of spite, the demon took up residence in the woman's. Uh, it's terrible. Vagina and bit, this should have been a terrible, and bit down on her lover's member to prevent her from having a child. In response, the woman hired a blacksmith to fashion a steel penis to smash the demon's teeth and restore her fertility, according to the legend. Well, I hope they sort out their mascot issues because this sounds like a very honored tradition. Yeah. In this area. So, guys, keep your penis unoffensive. Just keep it respectful. Keep your penis mascots respectful. All right, for isn't that terrible, let's go, uh, speaking of uh, traditions, let's go to Lauren Boebert, speaking on the House floor. She's a, a Republican Congress member from Colorado. She has something to say to Democrats about 
what they honor, what what they honor, and what they worship, and what she does by contrast. It's past time House Democrats start to have a little empathy and dismount their moral high horse of climate change. It's clear they have a climate religion. They worship the earth, while I worship the creator, not the creation. We are here to be good stewards of our land. So stop sacrificing the American families at your altar of climate change. So we're supposed to be good stewards of the land. Doesn't that include protecting the climate? Yeah, why not worship the earth? Well, yeah, why not worship the earth? But her point is that she doesn't worship the earth. She worships the creator, but the creator created the earth. And it's in the Bible. There's something about being good stewards of the land, sure. which means you yeah. take care of the land, which is relates to climate change. So she's almost proving, undermining her own moral authority. Uh, looks like she's not doing a very good job at being a Christian. Let's worship the earth and the creator. That's what I say. Why yeah. Not? And if you want to worship the creator, take care of the, 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 the stuff he created, which yeah. is the land. Yeah. Take care of the climate. She's not the sharpest pencil in the box. Well, you can say that about many for a while. You can say that about many members of Congress. I'd sure. say the majority. <laughs> All right. Uh, and those are our four basic food groups. For this week's guest, we are joined by Sharmin Narwani. She is a columnist at The Cradle. That's the cradle.co. And we are going to speak to her about the latest uproar in Israel with these major protests over judicial reforms. We're going to speak to her about Syria, where there's been a new flare-up of fighting between the occupying U.S. military force and militias. And we're going to talk about Iran and the recent protests there over the so-called morality police enforcing the wearing of the hijab. Let's go to the interview. Thank you so much for joining. We're so excited to have you. It's really good to be here and meet you guys for the first time. So we thought we'd start out asking you about Israel. There are obviously uh, there are protests. Uh, hundreds of thousands have been protesting as you have covered or as the cradle has covered. Netanyahu is back in Biden's good graces. What are your thoughts on this situation, which is being praised by some as a major moment for democracy? I mean, for people like myself, who've never really viewed Israel as a democracy, um, it's, you know, whatever, we, we, we'll we move with that language. Um, but I think, uh, you know, when, when Israel, Israelis themselves and uh, American Jews are um, questioning Israel's democracy, I think this is, this is, this is, uh, we're, we're seeing something uh, really shift in 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 uh, the perception of Israel within and outside for me for me this recent crisis in Israel uh, is maybe not as important as some of the others we've been seeing in recent years I mean since the Syrian war which is sort of has been for the last decade my area of concentration we've really seen Israel's own concept of a, its strategic depth um, change dramatically. You know, I always say its borders have shrunk during the course of the Syrian conflict. Uh, on the Syrian border, where prior to the conflict, there had been talks about, you know, uh, reconciliation talks between Israel and Syria. On its border with Lebanon, uh, for sure, uh, Hezbollah, the Lebanese resistance group, has, has uh, established uh, security deterrence. So Israel can't play as it likes in the Lebanese theater as in the past. Iran's ascendancy in the region has also uh, sort of stymied Israel's efforts to, to expand its strategic depth. Now we have, some would argue, well, Israel, after the Abraham Accords, has established even more strategic depth than, than, than before the Syrian crisis um, by, uh, you know, forging relations with with uh, Arab neighbors. Um, I would argue that really, you know, the main party to look at is the UAE. They've led the Abraham Accords initiative. And I mean, they're the ones who've really, really intensified relations with Israel across many fields, economic, military, and otherwise, uh, in a very short span of time. Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, these 
these other countries haven't moved, you know, remotely as quickly. So, uh, but but Israel's domestic situation has now potentially put the brakes on this this new regional thrust of Israel's, you know, with the UAE. Because even Abu Dhabi cannot stomach defying uh, regional Arab opinion and moving forward with Israel, not because of its domestic crisis over judicial reform so much, but um, more over uh, the, the intensification of clashes and the daily killing of Palestinians in the West Bank, which I think really erupted in May 2021, but has 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 gone crazy these these past few months. Um, so, you know, for me, Israel's borders are shrinking. You know, the idea from of expanding well into Iraq and having relations through Syria, Jordan, Iraq, um, and further uh, have have uh, have been crippled somewhat. And then, of course, they have their domestic domestic issues. So, um, this is not a good time for Israel. It doesn't really matter if Joe Biden or the UK Prime Minister are talking to Netanyahu or not, um, Israel is really teetering on the edge because an old colleague of mine, uh, Adnan Abu Ode, who was uh, Jordan's chief of the royal court for some time under King Hussein and was at Camp David Talks and is just one of those remarkable people in the region who've lived through everything and sat in every room with everybody, um, once said to me, he is originally Palestinian, and he once said to me that Israel uh, is really premised on two foundations. One are the myths it's spun about, um, you know, Jewish victimhood, uh, Palestine being a swamp before Zionists came to claim it and built it up into the region's best technology hub. Um, and the other premise is Aliyah, so Jews moving to Israel and continuing to move to Israel. And I think now we're seeing the reversal of those two things. I mean. Is there, you know, can Israel claim Jewish victimhood anymore? Can it, can it claim to be a democracy? Can it, can it, um, you know, claim to be the, 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 you know, the recipient the, on, on the receiving end of, of terrorism? I don't think that's true anywhere, including in Washington. You know, I think those myths have slowly fizzled away. Um, and then, of course, now we're hearing with the crisis, the domestic crisis, and the rise of Palestinian armed resistance in the West Bank. And inside Israel, um, we are seeing, uh, you know, reports about uh, more and more Israelis requesting second passports, right, from sit claiming citizenship from a country that maybe their parents were from, um, and also the flow of capital out of Israeli banks uh, elsewhere, probably Europe or North America. I mean, I think Israel's battling on all fronts. It's it's it, it's not an easy time, um, and of course. The media focuses not on those things, not on, I listed thing after thing after thing, but uh, they're focusing on this domestic dispute right. you know, as though it's the be all and end all. But I think Israel's being hit from all sides. And we did a, we, the Cradle did a piece yesterday on, on this phenomena. And um, one of the things that's, is, that's really worth mentioning is a lot of the Israeli uh, leadership, uh, former military, former intelligence, et cetera, um, have been pointing out that Israel's domestic crisis over the judicial reforms has a massive um, set of security repercussions for the state. Um, the concept of deterrence just doesn't hold in the psychology of its enemies when it sees Israel fractured so deeply from within. Just to clarify one thing, when you talk about the myth of Jewish victimhood, you're talking about the claims by Israel that it's always acting defensively yeah. in all of these yeah. actual offensive actions it's taken since its founding, ethnic yeah. cleansing in 1948. Uh, yeah. It's founding being the uh, initial offensive act, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I am talking about Zionism and yeah. Israel. Yeah. yeah. It seems like there is a change in perception, especially among young people. But mm. do you think that's changing Washington's um, policies towards Israel at all? I can't, you know, I haven't uh, lived in the States for a really, really long time, but of course I do read about it. And, you know, I remember following years ago, in particular, a um, gentleman called Peter Beinart. Yeah. Beinart, and, and you could see the shift through someone like him who was quite influential and who was 
um, referencing this change in, um, in, in, in young American Jews in particular, yeah. you know, um, I mean, I, I was, my experience with um, sort of, you know, uh, U.S. Zionist was quite different when I went to university in the States, you know, <laughs> it was a very different scene, you know, it was unquestioned. Right. People like Noam Chomsky and Norman Finkelstein were, um, well, especially people like Finkelstein, were were really ostracized from all Jewish organizations. Um, I actually had the privilege of being taught by, and I can't remember his name now. God, he was he was such an extraordinary person. Um, he was he was one of the original heads of the American Jewish Congress, and uh, he was a professor of mine. And um, you know, we, we did, you, it, it was a very different environment. You really couldn't call out anything. Um, and, and it was when uh, the narrative about two state solution was starting to take hold and people had a lot of hope um, and Oslo and the Madrid Peace Conference were in the making. So very different time. Of course, fast forward a few decades, you know, nobody takes Oslo seriously. Nobody takes the Palestinian Authority seriously. Nobody takes Israeli promises seriously at all, especially when they come from Netanyahu. And I think that's probably um, reflected in younger U.S. Jews right now. Right. And of course, now Netanyahu has agreed to um, uh, give Ben Gavir his National Guard. Uh, so and, and is basically just pausing the judicial overhaul. So. He's being very tricky, and and like the New York Times is totally falling for it, not focusing on the fact that he made this disgusting agreement with Ben Gavir. Yeah, you know, I I have to say one of the benefits of um, working at the cradle and spending a lot of time in the region is you start to lose, uh, you start to come out of the the Western narrative yeah. bubble, you know, without even realizing it, and. Uh, so, you know, when I hear that people are talking at that level, okay, we can meet with Netanyahu because he he froze the judicial reform issue till May, but Ben Gavir did this. Let's ignore that for the time being. He's not Netanyahu. Let's meet with it. It's it's crazy. It's not, this is not policy. This is this is not, you know, this represents no values. This represents no um, strategic policy. This I mean, uh, it's, it's um, uh, I think, pretty reflective of U.S. policy in the region. You know, one minute buddying up with uh, the region's dictators and the next moment, you know, if things flip a bit, turning on them, you know, you, you, you know that, um, and it's become like a laughing point in, in, in pla on places like Twitter where, you um, uh, if, if uh, you know, if India starts to uh, talks about importing Russian oil, um, the next moment the State Department is looking at India's human rights record, you know, or same with Saudi Arabia and a handful of other countries. So we just really he, he wants he, he'll now talk to Netanyahu. The U.S. Israeli relationship is very tight because they have the same um, global outlook. You know, um, they will nine out of 10 times fall on the same side of issues in the same way that Russia and Iran or Iran and China or China and Russia will fall on the same side of issues um, just because their global outlook is, su is, is such. You know what I mean? It's I mean, you folks have probably faced this in, in a sense. If you question the war in Ukraine, you're seen as a Putin supporter. Right, of course. Who, question chemical weapons use, for instance, by the Syrian government in Iraq, Aaron, you're called an Assadist. So it's it's ridiculous. Like you can have a point of view and just because it coincides with somebody else's right. point of view, it doesn't mean, you know, you, you have the same intentions or, um, but, but I think the world is polarizing and this is kind of my area, geopolitics. So the world is polarizing into um, two uh, axes and it's been so hard to characterize what these axes are. You can say pro-West and pro-Russia, but it's just actually pro-Russia. Is it pro-China? Is it pro europe You know, what is the other axes? And, and it really is, um, I think, going back to the basics, going back to the basics of international law, non-intervention non in states, um, upholding the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, you know, the UN Charter in a nutshell. 
Um, but also it doesn't mean these are picture perfect governments or countries. It just means that the world is going to a bad place fast and there is another view in town, right? There is another vision for where we can go. And I think the Chinese, it's not the perfect framing, but they, they call it peaceful modernization. And um, they really mean economic development, but without conflict in the midst. I mean, how do you develop economically if there's conflict uh, constantly? So really, if you look at uh, these two outlooks, you can, you know, pretty much figure where every country stands. You know, are you okay with ongoing conflict and managing conflict? Or are you, you know, now talking about unusual rapprochement situations and forging ahead the Saudis and the Iranians, for instance, you know, yeah. this is why China could broker that deal and not Washington. It's because uh, the U.S. is sort of, you know, knee deep in its forever wars mentality. And the the Chinese, they want to make money. They want to expand. They want to build roads and railways and pipelines and networks and, uh, you know, open up borders and, and create, uh, you know, trade between use soft power instead of hard power. Um, and is increasingly coming under attack for doing the very things that one used to think the West espouses. You know, I mean, everything's shifting, and eventually we're going to have to characterize what these two poles are because I think it'll make our work as journalists much more easy. You know, um, to explain uh, events as they as they take place. I want to ask you about Syria. The U.S. is occupying about one third of Syria. It only really gets discussed in the U.S. media when U.S. forces come under attack. And that mm -hmm. happened recently when a U.S. military contractor was killed. Other service members were wounded in some attacks yeah. by militias. They're defined in the U.S. as Iran-backed militias. Though I'm not even sure. I mean, maybe you can help us clarify who exactly these forces are. But the, the official line we get is that the U.S. is in Syria to fight ISIS. And having covered Syria extensively, I'm wondering if you could comment on that, what the U.S. actually is doing in Syria, why you think it's actually there, and, and what is the nature of these clashes that flare up occasionally between the U.S. and these other forces? So, yeah, it's true. There have been clashes over um, a number of years now between um, known or unknown fighters and U.S. troops or U.S.-backed troops in in particularly along the Syrian-Iraqi border that is so strategic for so many parties. Um, I think what differentiates the attacks on Friday, which I think was March 24th, um, there were, I think, four attacks, one after another. And these attacks um, used drones, and they were targeted. In the past, these little rocket attacks would you know, targeting U.S. bases would tend to fall outside. But these were apparently um, well targeted and did hit the bases. And initially what we heard was um, there were a large number of U.S. casualties um, or casualties at the bases, uh, including U.S. Uh, servicemen. And then the, the net result was um, no one American contractor died. That's kind of how it started in Iraq as well. It's just, it's always one American contractor. I don't believe these stories. I think the Americans, like the Israelis, um, downplay or, or, or just flat out lie about their casualties. I mean, we've seen this since the Iraq war where, um, you know, the, the U.S. administration of George W. Bush uh, decided that there would be no televised um, uh you know, uh, footage of, of um, not body bags, but caskets right. of returning, you know, uh, U.S. casualties. So there is this, you know, the psychology of we can't be hit. I, I, th I think we're seeing a new thing here. I think the also the unraveling and the decline of U.S. power um, generally and uh, around the world uh, for various, various reasons. Um, and the ascension of countries like China, Russia, and Iran. And, uh, you know, the, the, the also that it's become so much more common for U.S. allies to um, voice opposition to U.S. policy, to say, no, we're going to do business with Russia, to say, no, we don't think those sanctions are right. You know, this kind of thing 
um, African countries. We're seeing this all the time now in videos, um, criticizing uh, European leaders who were instrumental in the colonization of the continent. You know, um, it's it's like a dam has broken slightly, but this also has psychologically, I think, um, emboldened many people who wouldn't otherwise have have taken action to take action in this region. So I do think. You know, when people like Rand Paul talk about, like, why are we in this region? We are risking American life. Th that is a very real threat now. A year ago, it wasn't. But today, um, that threat has changed considerably. And I think um, we're going to see more and more U.S. Um, US uh, casualties and targets in this region. I'm just curious, is the U.S. actually fighting ISIS as they claim they're there to do? Wow. And, and what is the U.S. doing with all this oil that it's occupying inside Syria? Uh, so we did some investigations on where the oil is going. Uh, it, it is a bit simplistic to say that the U.S. is taking the oil. For sure, it is because of the U.S. the oil can be taken. Okay, So even 200 U.S. troops in a few Syrian oil fields enables Kurds and other militias to be the recipients of Syrian oil. Okay, If, if those U.S. military personnel were not there, they would not be able to do that. But the oil gets taken. It's you know it's basically a strategy of depriving the Syrian state, like sanctions do, right, of vital revenues, uh, which it can use to rebuild the country, to restabilize the economy, to um, reestablish services. Uh, Syria was a big uh, um, service state in terms of education, healthcare. You know these were these were entitlements that the Syrians uh, that Syrians enjoyed. Um, so depriving Syria of its revenues, um, it's, you know, that whole region is after ISIS, after the conflicts have become like all conflict zones. You know, there's a lot of smuggling and um, playing with prices and playing with commodities, uh, holding them back to raise prices. We see this in Lebanon. We see this throughout the region now. So the oil gets siphoned off to um, to Iraq. It gets taken to Iraq um, in in great quantities. And some of it is sold by um, U.S.-backed Kurds to the Syrian government. Um, and some of it is uh, directed to Idlib, which is, you know, the last stronghold of the the most extreme group, militant groups in Syria. Um, and then from Iraq, we were not so, so clear onward. I mean, it went to various parties and most of the oil were, it was, um, in, in uh, you know, U.S.-backed Kurdish areas, um, and thereafter one doesn't know. But it, the U.S. is not in Syria to defeat ISIS. Um, one could argue through um, existing U.S. government documentation that they that the that the American government was um, more than happy to see a uh, a Sunni. Uh, militant group emerge on the Syrian-Iraqi border that uh, would, you know, push back against uh, Syrian army forces and allied forces. They, you know, from John Kerry to the Defense Intelligence Agency, there's there's just yeah. so much commentary, you know, that is, you know, just repeating on what we've known for a yeah, long John time. John Kerry said, uh, I mean, for those who don't know, John Kerry said, we sat back and watched as ISIS spread in Syria. Right. Um, and we thought we could use ISIS's growth in Syria as leverage to basically oust Assad. John Kerry admitted that in a private recording. In terms of, um, you know, what is U.S. strategy in, in uh, Syria, the, the claim is, um, of course, for for uh, to, to protect against ISIS. But in Syria, very, very clearly, we saw when the Russians came in and there was a huge drive. Within three months, um, basically all of ISIS was being pushed back in three months um, across Syria. This is at a time where ISIS had, you know, a majority, controlled a majority of the territory in Syria. Um, they were pushed back right to the Euphrates, which is when the Americans suddenly abandoned Raqqa, their supposed fight against um, ISIS in Raqqa, the, the capital of ISIS in, in Syria. They just abandoned it wholesale and rushed to the Euphrates to stop Syrian, uh, the Syrian army and its allied forces from crossing the Euphrates. Because this was a line where, on the other side of that line, which the U.S. occupies right now, is where 
um, is where Syria's breadbasket is and where Syria's oil fields are. Um, and so I wouldn't, I generally don't think that the U.S. is so desperate for piddly Syri Syrian oil or the wheat of Syria that they're there for that. It's more about, um, it's part of the sanction strategy, you know, um, destabilizing the state by taking away its revenues and its ability to provide for citizens, you know. Um, so, so there... ISIS still exists in Syria in pockets very close to U.S. bases and has done for many, many years. Um, ISIS is a very useful tool for uh, the United States. Anytime it wants to claim that it must be somewhere, it just has to say ISIS. You know, it, it's it, nobody even bothers explaining beyond that. So um, but. Really importantly, why is the U.S. in Syria? Why do U.S. troops remain in Iraq despite um, a parliamentary law being passed um, to eject all foreign forces from Syria, from, from Iraq? And it is because for decades, the U.S., um, I mean, certainly since the Iranian revolution, the U.S. has sought to impede a land route between Iran and the Mediterranean, between Iran and occupied Palestine, okay? This, this is a, from the Levant to the Persian Gulf, extremely, extremely important strategic areas, not just in terms of natural resources, but control of waterways um, uh, and, and the major old silk routes as well. So um, wh how do we know this? Um, US forces in Syria, <laughs> Are all on the border, okay? It's 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 their last stand. They do not want the borders between Iraq and Syria ever to open and thrive. Open borders means diplomacy, means economy, means marriages, means you know trade, the, the the whole gamut. It's normalization, true normalization of relations between states. The same thing now exists between um, Lebanon and Syria. Lebanon is either by law, things like the U.S.'s uh, Caesar Act uh, in 2019, I think, yeah. that was imposed on Syria. It's a set of sanctions. Um, but Lebanon, um, just by virtue of being so afraid of the U.S. ambassador in Beirut, will not dare do anything across that border in fear that Lebanon's um, own internal financial fiasco will escalate beyond you know anything that, that the country can cope with. Um, the Iran-Iraq border, okay, <laughs> Uh, is the, Iran's constantly getting attacked from the Iraqi border. Kurds, uh, like, you know, ISIS remnants, it's not always clear. Um, but, but these are very much directed attacks. And you can take this back to uh, the Iranian revolution. In, in just in, in 1979, um, 78 or 79, the president of Iraq, uh, and Hafez Assad, the president of Syria, had struck a deal, okay, a, a massive, wide, uh, widespread uh, reconciliation deal that would, you know, ideally terminate these countries being at odds with each other forevermore. And what happened, there was a coup d'etat, Saddam Hussein came in and killed the Iraqi military officers that supported um, this deal with Syria. OK, then he launched an eight year war with Iran. OK, so you cut off the Syrian Iraqi border and then you have this uh, th war with Iran. That's again. Right. It, it is this land route connecting the Persian Gulf via Iran to the Levant, to the Mediterranean is a no go. It's like how for many years in Europe, um, allowing the Russians and Chinese to get close was a no go. You know, this was not ter this. This was never going to be allowed. Um, of course, things have changed since then, and um, but but it, it needs to be understood that the main thing is to inhibit Iran's um, movement into the Levant. Okay, whether uh, militarily, trade, uh, uh, you know, through through human relationships, uh, culturally, etc. And and that is why the U.S. is there because what the what the growth of ISIS and the civil the the, the war launch against um, Syria did essentially was backfire. The Syrian army was able to amass a set of alliances in the region that were strong enough to overthrow the combined efforts of NATO and the resources of the GCC, right? Um, and, and so then what? That meant that the same forces that fought ISIS 
um, in, in, uh, across those borders in, in Iraq and Syria were good with each other now. There were, um, there, there, were, uh, there were joint military operations between the Syrians and Iraqis. That had never happened. You know, um, many things and many political decisions that were made together, the Americans had to st stay put at that border. Um, they had they had nothing else, you know. Um, so I, th you know, the U.S. presence in Syria today is not because of the oil or the weed, and it's not because of ISIS. It's to prevent um, the Persian Gulf uh, and and the Levant from forging close relations and normalizing um, ties and de-escalating the region and reaching peace and development. And why do they uh, fear that? You know, I mean, some of this is historic. Uh, you know, these, the, first of all, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran are civilizational states. I don't know if you're seeing it in Western media discourse as much, but um, for those of us paying attention to this language of the civilizational language in geopolitics that's slowly entering, um, the West seems to be very, very against it. These these countries, these states have legitimacy that goes beyond the nation state borders um, that were established in the Westphalian system. You know, um, this is a resource rich region. These are the original trade routes. I mean, you know, we talk about uh, Western ascendancy in the world and hegemony for centuries, but um, and it's not like Asia is suddenly becoming a powerhouse for you know economy. Asia was and always has been the original, the world's original economic powerhouse. Colonialism sidetracked that for a few years. We're coming back to what's natural. These trade routes and sea routes are essential to um, global commerce, you know. And what's interesting is just uh, U.S. aggression has forced a lot of these countries to find, all, you know, to turn, to look or to establish for alternative systems to do business, whether it's bypassing the U.S. dollar, um, whether it's creating alternative um, banking messages, messaging systems to the Belgian-based SWIFT system, um, whether it's creating, it's a possibility, creating a commodities-based currency to replace, to replace currencies in, in general that among these countries that are trading increasingly with each other, um, there's, there's a huge shift. And, you know, I always say that World War III started with Syria, um, keeping in mind that the Third World War was never going to be conventional war because of the existence of nuclear weapons, um, that World War III would look more like a regular warfare, proxy wars, uh, you know, propaganda, regime change, that kind of what we've been seeing for years. But the reason I, you know, point to Syria as opposed to Ukraine or Venezuela or other countries for this is because Syria is where we first saw a major power standoff. So world wars are marked, one, by a major power standoff, okay? Not just between two, but multiple. Um, the other thing that marks a world war is uh, as it progresses and as you know, we get to the end, um, we start to see the emergence of new global institutions and a switching of global networks, a switching of global systems, a switching of the global order, which we are seeing now, and if you, if, if Americans still have any doubt about it, we just today we're doing a piece on um, the U.S. has an annual threat assessment report, and in March they put out their 2023 one, um, and it talks about, you know, I think the most um, important takeaway from that is that it talks about the U.S. having a very, very small time frame now to impact and shape the multipolar order that is emerging. You know, I mean, people need to take note in Washington. You cannot structure policy and build strategies um, around uh, yesteryear's thinking. You can't. You have to recognize and say multipolar order and then completely change your thinking paradigms and, and make assessments according to what is actually happening, not what you want to happen. I don't actually know how we got to this conversation. I just rambled. No, um, that's exactly what I was asking about. Yeah. Well, let me ask you one more question about Syria, and then we can move on to um, other countries, including Iran. The U.S. has recently issued these waivers on its sanctions uh, after the earthquake in yeah. Syria. Um, do you think that these waivers will have an impact in terms of allowing direly needed supplies to get into Syria? 
And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. Such an interesting conversation. A very different picture of what she calls West Asia, what we often call in the U.S., the Middle East, but a very different picture than we're used to. And uh, she has a lot of experience covering it because she actually yeah. lives there. Imagine that. She she talks about the uh, hijab and what she observed in Iran. Um, make sure you join the Substack or Locals, usefulidiots.substack.com or usefulidiots.locals.com so you can see what she has to say about that. It's pretty fascinating. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them.